Good. Yeah. Right. Let me go for it. Yeah. Well, everybody, happy Constitution Day. Welcome to the National Constitution Center. My name is Jenna, and I'm very excited for this program today. We have Simon and Darrow from the Slants uh, joining us. Uh, the Slants are uh, one of the first um, all Asian American dance rock bands in the world, um, but they are also the center of a landmark uh, Supreme Court uh, case centering around the First Amendment. So we're going to get into all of that and kind of have a Q&A in just a minute, but I figured since they were here, I'd ask them to play a little bit for us first. So please welcome the Slants. So thank you so much. We're, we're really excited to be here. This is our second Constitution Day being here. Uh, normally, I have my uh, guitarist, Joe Zhang, with me, but he's in China at the moment visiting his family. So we've got Darrow, an emo pop punk artist, uh, playing some songs with me today. And we thought we'd start off with a song called 1821. This is a song about the 18th and 21st Amendment of, of the Constitution. We were, we were asked to jump on this project from NPR, and we have like folks like Dolly Parton and the Octopus Project uh, all involved, each writing a, a different song about one of the amendments. And does anyone here know what the 18th Amendment is by chance? <laughs> so it's about prohibition, like way back in the day where the government thought it would be a really good idea to ban the sale of alcohol. It turned out it wasn't so great of an idea because a couple of years later, they changed their mind and passed the 21st Amendment, which basically got rid of it. And as I was working on this project, it kind of reminded me of, you know, the story of America growing up. And, and it's kind of like our own story of growing up because a lot of us like when growing up, we thought, oh, when I turn 18, I'm going to be an adult. I could do whatever I want. It turns out you can't buy like a beer or wine or something like that, not until you turn 21. So just like the 18th and 21st Amendments were lessons on testing those boundaries for, as a country, um, this song is a little bit about that. Remember counting the days, remember grasping for moments. Freedom was a digital way. Remember thinking the world closed up on you like an island. Free and you see and group. Remember when you were teenage staring up at the ceiling. Emotions like a runaway train. Remember making the promise to yourself not to be cautious. Flawless and wandering. Watchful eyes, they are misjudged. One breath, they're on the go. You were 18, now you're 21. Through their lines and they change the mind. You were 18, now you're 21. House by rules, now you're free to run. You were 18. Now you're 21, through their lines and they changed the mind. You were 18, now you're 21, house by rules, now you're free to run. Remember when people told you that you can't be dreaming. The present luxury's fading like the air that you're breathing. Remember when you were three, filling your lung without question. The first time that you fell in the sea, and could you ever imagine if they board up the ocean? The cracks come immediately. The watchful eyes, they are misjudged. One breath there on the cusp. You were 18, now you're 21. Through their lines and they changed the mind. You were 18, now you're 21. Housed by rules, now you're free to run. You were 18, now you're 21. Through the eyes and they changed the minds. You were 18, now you're 21. House by rules, now you're free to run. Free to run. 
Thank you. So the, the next song for us is a little more personal, and it was actually about that journey of fighting for the right star name. You'll, you'll hear a little bit more about that later. But it's what really put our band at the center of like this First Amendment battle that went to the Supreme Court and kind of got me involved with a lot of other <laughs> Supreme Court battles and trying to pass legislation, uh, including here in, in Pennsylvania. And that's why we started working with artists like Chance the Rapper, Meek Mill, um, Killer Mike, Jay-Z, John Legend, all to collaborate on trying to protect creative expression for artists. And that's why I think the, the First Amendment is so powerful because it really is important, especially for us as folks of color, to be able to use it to speak truth to power. And this song is really about that sentiment, like for our band, fighting for the right to identify uh, ourselves to choose our identity was so personal and meaningful. And so this song is really an open letter to the US Patent and Trademark Office and to anybody else who just doesn't believe that our communities have that right. It's called From the Heart and um, we wanna invite you to be a part of it. So it's very easy. All you gotta do is yell out the word no when we point at you. Can we try that? You gotta yell no. <laughs> All right, let's try it. One, two, three. One, two, three. Look at that. You already know the song. Sorry if our notes are too sharp. Sorry if our voice is too raw. Don't make the pen a weapon and censor our intelligence until our thoughts mean nothing at all. Sorry if you take offense. You made up rules and played pretend. We know you fear change. It's something so strange, but nothing's going to get in our way. There's no room for your backwards feelings and backyard dealings. We're never going to settle. Right, here we go. Never going to settle. No. We both remain silent. No. It's our defining moment, and we sing from the heart. We sing from the heart. I said, no, we won't become placed in no. It's a rock and roll nation, and we sing from the heart. We sing from the heart. Sorry if we try too hard takes the power back for ours. The language of oppression will fall to education until your words can't hurt us again. Sorry if we take offense. We may have said I make amends. The system's all wrong. It won't be too long until your words can't hurt us again. There's no room. For your backwards feelings and backyard dealings, we're never gonna settle. Never gonna right, settle. Go. No, we won't remain silent. No, it's our defining moment, and we sing from the heart. We sing from the heart. I said, No, we won't become placed. No, it's a rock and roll nation, and we sing from the heart. We sing from the heart. One, two, three, four. No, we won't remain silent. No, it's our defining moment, and we sing from the heart. We sing from the heart. I said, No. We won't become placed in no. It's the rock and roll nation, and we sing from the heart. We sing from the heart. I said no. We sing from the heart. We sing from the heart. I said no.
that we sing from the heart, that we sing from the heart. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. And please uh, give it up for Darrow, who's so gracious to come out here and join me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I need to re -dye it. <laughs> Can I plug? Thank you Ooh, so much. That was amazing. Oh. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to join you now. Okay. Simon, thank hey. you for coming back. It's so good to see you again. Good to see you. Uh, so we've mentioned that your case was um, kind of a landmark First Amendment decision. So could you tell us a little bit about the background of your case? What was it about? And uh, you know what, um, how the Supreme Court ultimately decided? So when I started this band in 2006, 2007, we, we called it the slants because we want to reappropriate this like really outdated racial stereotype that people oftentimes make about Asian Americans. And uh, our community was really great. They supported us along the way. We did a lot of fundraising. We did a lot of anti-bullying campaigns. Uh, we played a lot of like dive bars and punk rock shows. And along the way, uh, we decided to register a trademark for our band name. It's actually super important for artists um, be, to be able to protect your, your rights. But when we did that, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office denied us this right. They, they said that our name was disparaging or offensive to Asian people, even though we're an all-Asian band and working with our, our community. And so when the, when the government... Um, and, is doing something like that, they need to be able to prove that it's actually offensive. The problem is they didn't actually have any proof. All they had and all that, you can see this in all the court documents was a citation of urbandictionary.com, like a wiki joke website. And so we needed to fight that, we needed to challenge it. And eventually it took using the first amendment saying that the government's actually abridging our free speech that got us to the Supreme Court of the United States. And so tell us how the Supreme Court ultimately decided on your case. Uh, we won unanimously. Yes. <laughs> That's fantastic. That was a 2017 case. Um, and so, uh, but that was the end of a really long journey for you. So at 2017, like when did this start? Uh, about 2009. So about eight years of my life. was. Yeah. Spent. So can tell us, um, you know, so you make the decision that this is something you want to fight for. This is something that you really found to be injustice and uh, want to bring it up through the court system. What is that process as a, as a person, as a you know, individual who's, who's going to take on this, a case like, like this? Yeah. So you can't just like roll up to the Supreme court and say, I want to, I want, you know, I demand, I'm going to write you a letter. Uh, you kind of got to through the process. So for us, that was going through a lot of other lower courts and kind of decision-making places uh, but it took about eight years to, to get up there, and, and including uh, a stop at Washington, D.C., with what we call the Federal Circuit. Um, it, but, yeah, it's just a lot of appeals. And it feels really dragged out, and I feel like it's a lot of, like, hurry up and wait. Like, you got to do all this prep work. You're filing. You're, you're trying to uh, make your point, and then you got to wait six months, sometimes a year, for a court to make a decision on whether they want to, like, give you the dignity of moving on or not. Yeah. And so you finally get there. We, we heard a little bit earlier about what it's like from the judge's point of view, how they approach cases. What's it like um, sitting in the Supreme Court kind of in the presence of the justices? Like, what, tell us about that experience. So being in the Supreme Court itself, if it's like super weird, <laughs> like you have all these justices, you got all these like attorneys, they're all using my name. They're using the name of my band. But like, I can't help but think they don't know me, uh, especially when the government uh, attorneys were accusing us of saying that we are saying we are racist, that we are doing things that were really bad for our community, that we we're anti-Asian, when they had, did not find a single shred of evidence. And so in many ways, it felt really invisible. It felt really insignificant be, to be in there. Like, I'm fighting for freedom of speech in America's highest court. And in that room, I can't say a thing. I can't speak for myself. So it feels kind of disempowering in a lot of ways. I have to rely on attorneys, other people to speak for me. So it was a little bit surreal because you had all these people arguing about what's offensive to Asian people, but the only Asian people in the room were not allowed to speak on it. 
they, they, they didn't bother asking us for our opinions. But, um, but that being said, it was like really neat to, to kind of hear these things, see what they were thinking um, and, and to actually kind of get an insight into like how they need to make decisions that impact everybody, like all Americans. So obviously like as you know, your case was a First Amendment case and had to do with your trademark. But as a musician, I can imagine that this was just a, a, the First Amendment in general, freedom of speech is just so important to you. Um, so can you speak to a little, like how did you approach it as, as an artist and knowing that you were fighting for these? I mean, at the end rights? of the day, I was like, you know, it should not be up to the government to decide what's right or wrong for, for our community to decide mm -hmm. how we talk to ourselves. It should be up to our community. Like I, I'm held accountable by other people who look and sound like me, people who, who I live and breathe with in my community. So I wanted us to be able to make that decision. And it's especially important in the world of art. Like art is supposed to kind of push the envelope a little bit. Like I, I firmly believe art and especially music, it's like a piece of glass. Like it's both a, a mirror to show where society is, but it's also a window into what's possible. And so for us to say, like, we want to get to a point where racial slurs aren't uh, offensive anymore. We want to get to a point where we don't live in a racist system. It, it meant, like, that we needed to do a lot of work as a country. And for the government to, like, stop us in its tracks, it made me feel like um, that I needed to, like, uh, learn a whole new thing, which is how to work within the system itself to transform it so that ultimately it helped everybody. Because... The thing about the, the the law they were using, like we did all these studies on it, the only time they really used it, like said, oh, you can't do this because it's too racist or too whatever, they only used it against people of color. So all, all the applications of people reappropriating words, which uh, many of us could think of a lot of terms like that, whether it's folks of color, people from the queer community, like whenever we try to do something, the government said, that's too radical. We don't like that. That's offensive. But when other people did things, like pe big corporations, people with a lot of power and money, they got the benefit of the doubt every time, which is why every single word uh, that you could think of that's offensive for a community group was a registered trademark, including the word slant, which they told me was like, you know, impossible for me to register. There are over 800 other applications for slant, and none of them were cited as being offensive. So clearly they had different standards when it came to people like me. Yeah, I remember you saying that the last time you were here, and I found that like so fascinating that it was like, look at how you're applying the law, and like, is is that really equal to everybody? Um, so you do have a foundation. Um, so which uh, kind of so have you seen kind of the results of your case and um, kind of expand rights for other Asian Americans and other artists and uh, people? What well, tell us a little bit about your foundation work, and then I'll throw to you guys because I I actually don't like asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So. Um... Right after our Supreme Court uh, case was resolved, I continued to file for other things. And earlier I mentioned like collaborating with a lot of like musicians and especially rappers, because there was this case actually here in Pennsylvania called um, the uh, Jamal Knox versus Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, where uh, a young rapper covered an NWA song about a police officer who beat him up when he was just a kid. And he used the police officer's name and they decided to charge him with federal charges with, of terrorism and locked him up in jail. Um, and we tried to appeal saying like, that's an abridgment of his first amendment rights. He can certainly use music as a way to demonstrate his anger, to, to speak like his feelings about it. Um, and it, it turned out that there's a whole number, uh, a whole lot of other cases like this where a lot of uh, criminal charges are filed against rappers using their lyrics of their songs as evidence. And the funny thing is like, that well, it's not funny, but it's kind of ironic that like, they don't do the same thing for other artists. Mm -hmm. Like there's a, actually a genre of music called murder, murder ballads about country songs that talk about murdering your wife, your neighbor, other things. Uh, Johnny Cash is very popular for, <laughs> for, for popularizing yeah. this thing. And yet he was never cited as like an intent to murder, but they were using this to charge like black and brown communities. So I started joining a bunch of law professors and a bunch of rappers and other folks to try and change the laws. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of just started me down a path of like getting involved with more First Amendment work. And then um, a couple of years ago, we, we launched a nonprofit to kind of further that. So my foundation now invests in, we mentor an artist of color who want to, approach their art 
uh, but using it in a way that wants to impact society in some kind of way. So like arts and activism. And we've put on uh, Broadway plays. We've helped produce some films, uh, a lot of albums. And I've just been so proud to like see how art can, can change the world. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm going to throw to you guys. Do you, does anybody have questions in the room? Yeah, right over here. I had doubts all the time, um, especially as I was fighting for, uh, for our name. I mean, it, it's not easy. Like I, I almost lost my house because of how much it costs and, and how much time it was taking. I, I, was, I had to step away from being a full-time musician, like quit, quit that so I could get a bunch of side hustles to pay for all these legal bills and everything else. And all, all along, I'm like, is this worth it? Like, is this worth doing this? But then I realized that I didn't want anyone else to ever feel that way. Like the indignity of saying you are offensive to yourself and you can't even have the right to choose that for you, like what you want for yourself. And so um, when I heard, especially that the law was being used for other people who were like me, I, I realized I, could, I couldn't walk away. And so that's why I just kept doing it. But like, um, I would say if I didn't have the support of my community and all these organizations and other artists and their stories, and I, I probably would have given up. But, but thankfully, people were really supportive. Any other questions? Yeah. Is there anyone in your community that did not support you? Yeah, so the initial reaction was a little bit divided. Um, I would say there was, there was a small portion of Asian Americans who were concerned that if we won, uh, that it would open this floodgate of like hateful things to be registered, um, especially the Washington football team. People thought if we won, they would never change their name from this very offensive mascot. And thankfully, like one, that's not exactly how trademark laws work. Um, and second of all, we did see, especially after the murder of George Floyd, that um, there was kind of a more of awakening and people realizing of what was inappropriate. And the Washington football team did change their name and as well as many other major sports teams that had imagery that could be considered offensive. So um, there wasn't actually a, a flood of hate speech at all. What ended up happening was the, the trademark office saw this big spike in applications of terms that they uh, would normally reject things that could be considered offensive, but it turned out it were all from communities of color, nonprofits, artists who are reappropriating terms and saying, we want to own this for ourselves. We want our communities to say like, what's right and what's wrong. And it, it was, I was just so happy to see that people were actually using it in a way that was moving the conversation forward. Any other questions? Yeah, in the back. I'm sorry, did I feel scared when I was there? I mean, I was like super anxious and, and nervous. It was, it was weird, like I, I wasn't sure what to expect. So b back in 2017, our, our case was one of the more um, like prominent cases, like really high profile in the news uh, to, to the point where they actually couldn't guarantee that I could sit in the room for my own case and, and um, it took a lot of bargaining by my attorneys to make sure that me and my bandmates could actually get in. But when I when we got there, like a couple hours before the the arguments, there was a line that was about six blocks long. I mean, the the Supreme Court only holds a couple hundred people, but there were several thousand waiting, trying to get into the room. So I knew it was like a pretty pretty big deal, and. Um, yeah, I was, I was filled with a lot of nerves, but at, at the same time, I also felt like I had done everything I possibly could, like it, everything I could to, to tell our story, to, to, to speak the truth. And, you know, I, I knew that if I, if I didn't win, that hopefully someone else would kind of take up that mantle and keep trying. I, I mean, I will, I will share this like quick story that like of what really cemented that in for me. It was actually right after our case like we were walking outside of the building um down these steps to go to this big plaza and as we were walking out there's just like tons and tons of people there like the whole plaza was filled and i was like what are they all doing here they're waiting to go like go to a, on a tour or something like 
there's no way the you know courts in session they're not going to let all these people in and as we were walking down these steps like i'm halfway down and the crowd just erupts in applause they start cheering for our band and i'm like what's happening here and i get to those final steps and as as, as i enter this plaza these these two asian kids run up to me they're like simon Simon, our, our parents let, let us ditch school to be here today. And I was like, yo, what kind of Asian parents do you have? Like, <laughs> you know, because my parents never let me do that kind of thing. But they're like, no, no, we, we flew from California. They're freshmen in high school. And they told me that ever since they were kids in elementary school, they heard about the one who's fight, willing to fight for the dignity of our community. And they, they told me, they're like, you know, we, we want to, we saw what you're doing and we want to, to meet you and tell you that like when we finish high school, we're going to study public policy development in college. And after that, we're going to run for office and change the system that you've been fighting against for so long. And it just, at that moment, I remember thinking, it doesn't matter. Like it, it doesn't matter if I win or lose today because people understood that there, there's this whole other generation that understood it's not about these individual cases. It's about transforming a system, a system that was never designed for people like us, that we have to actually change it in, in order to actually feel the effects of like freedom, to, to truly feel like independent and, and get that sense of dignity for us. Because like the thing about the, the law I was fighting, it was written in the 1940s in the height of the Jim Crow era. It was not designed to protect our communities. And, and I knew that. It, no matter what it looked like on its face, it needed to be transformed in a way that allowed our communities to have a voice. And so uh, whatever anxieties or nervousness or fear I felt uh, before I, I was at the courtroom, like these kids actually uh, like showed me that there's a much bigger picture that I had to look at. That's really cool. Yes, question. Uh, well, first, the, 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 I originally had a lawyer who was a friend of mine, and he was the one that recommended I file for a trademark to begin with. He's like, oh, it's no big deal. It's like, it'll take you a few months. Uh, he was a little wrong about that. And then when he told me he couldn't continue to fight for our case, I just started Googling lawyers, and, and one wrote a blog about our case, and I wrote him a letter saying, like, this is what I'm doing. Will you help me out? And he agreed to do the case pro bono. So I didn't actually have to pay their law firm's fees, but I did have to pay off for all the court fees and appellate filing fees. And there's a lot of fees involved, like tens of thousands of dollars of fees, but um, but they were really, really generous and waiving like, you know, probably half a million to a million dollars worth of fees. All right, I think there was a question in the back. I like how did it impact my life? Uh, I'm sorry. I, I, Can you restate the question? I think when I was younger, I mean, I always had a passion for like helping other people out, like volunteering for nonprofits and things, but I always thought of it as like, um like short-term solutions right like if i saw somebody who's like asking for change i'd be like oh i i you know if i had some change i'd give them some money to buy a sandwich like as kids my my sister and i used to beg our parents for like spare change to like help these people out but i didn't realize that i needed to move upstream and think why are they hungry to begin with why is there poverty to begin with and like if we really want to get rid of hunger it's not going to be through giving out sandwiches it's got to be like dealing with the structure and the systems in place. And so as an adult, I started seeing the effects more and more, especially with like my case and realizing, oh, like those programs are important. Like you gotta get people a bed to sleep at night and a meal to fill their stomach. But really we gotta figure out why things are the way they are and, f and figure out how to address problems at that level. So I think as a kid, I was a little bit, um, I was just mostly looking at the symptoms as opposed to the root causes of things. And now I, I, I'm really focused on doing like systems work. This is a great question and really fantastic insight there. All right, question here. I think that um, 
you know, really, if we want to seek change, it requires a couple of things. Uh, one, you absolutely need persistence. It's a long game, and you got to realize that, that you might feel a lot of times you're losing that battle for a long time, but you got to fight for those principles that you, you really care about. Um, and second of all, you really need people, like a community support around you. So I'm a firm believer that, like, those who are closest to an issue need to be a part of the, the solution. Like if there's a problem in society you wanna see fixed, um, we can't just do it with good intentions. We gotta involve the people who are most impacted. And so like, for example, right now, um, working for a nonprofit that's like uh, de dealing with like uh, trying to make medicine more accessible to people. And it's great to just have a bunch of attorneys and scientists arguing over this stuff all day long. But at the end of the day, people like families who can't afford medicine, they need to be at the center of it. They need to be a part of that solution making process. So really thinking about like the kind of change you wanna make and thinking about who is involved is a big part of that. And it's the same thing for like, lawmakers have known for a long time about the problem of like the first amendment and, and music and using music as a way to like lock people up. But it wasn't until artists started getting involved, like music makers like myself or, or um, you know, Jay-Z who's been a big part of that. Like, like when we started getting involved, it brought more attention and scrutiny. And we're like, and here's some ways to make it work. Like, obviously we don't want a bunch of offensive stuff out there, but we don't want these laws used against our own communities. So let's think about meaningful approaches to this that don't step on people's rights. And so really thinking about that and keeping that at the top of your mind is really important. Yeah, in the back. Hi. I think if it's actually tied to hard evidence, that's one thing. And but to to be able to just assume intention from it, I think is really problematic, especially because particularly with rap music and uh, other forms of music, a lot of times these songs are kind of fictional, like they embody like kind of a pseudo biography, a pseudo identity um, that like is very expressive in nature in the same way that I would never want to see a murder uh, mystery writer get locked up for writing about a crime uh, because they're just writing, they're telling a story. So it's really, really important. Like now, if that story had a bunch of like links to real evidence and uh, a police could actually build a case from it because there's actual evidence, that's one thing. Um, but to only say like this person's intending on creating, uh, like committing a crime because they wrote a song about it, I think that's really problematic. And so like, you know, it, it, it's, there's, it's complicated. We need to like be able to balance a few few different things. But the problem with that we've seen and, and all the academics that have been studied this case is that there actually hasn't been evidence. And in more cases than not, when they retried these cases, they found out that multiple of these musicians were actually innocent of the charges that they, they were uh, supposed to be committing. All right, question right there. I think there are, there are definitely moments, yeah, where it's it's easy to lose hope. Um, but, but yeah, as I fell back to the community and continue to like fight fight for this thing, I realized that no matter how I like personally felt about it, whether I was feeling optimistic or uh, scared or, or or whatever, I needed to press forward because I needed to do to do the right thing. I I think um, one of my favorite quotes about like bravery because people would always say like, oh, this is very brave of you to do this and I'm like I feel terrified because I could lose everything um, but one of my favorite quotes is that like bravery is not the absence of fear it's choosing to move forward even when you feel afraid 
you know, when you know it's the right thing and you got to fight for it and you continue to move forward, I think that's ultimately what you got to do. One more question. Okay. I think at the end of the day, so we have a lot of really good laws. We have very bad enforcement of those laws. And so I think we're finding both the process is uh, like one really important part of it. And the second is just to, for people to think more deeply. So a lot of the laws that we have are just inherited from past eras that past decades and that sort of thing uh, eras that were maybe we didn't have the same social awareness that we do today and that's why i think like we need to involve community members and really thinking about like does this apply anymore um there's like if you actually study the amount of laws passed every year it's staggering there's like tens of thousands of laws that are constantly being added and in fact there's so many laws that uh, I'm probably like, you know, committing a crime right now and not even being aware of it. Like there's a lot of things that are irrelevant or things maybe were passed at one time that isn't quite so relevant anymore. And it's really important for us to be aware of those things and to remove them when they aren't uh, relevant and so we can move on and then to th rethink like what justice looks like. Like, for example, there were a lot of laws passed when my great grandparents and my grandparents were moving to this country as under the umbrella of what they called the Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, which was the only law in history that prohibited people from a certain country to like in, in mass to, to prevent immigration. And from that, they passed all these laws that basically said people of Chinese descent cannot own property. And they built that into a lot of state constitutions. Uh, including the state of Florida, uh, which to this day still has it on the books. Um, now, it may or may not always be enforced, but I'm like, as somebody who is of Chinese descent, I'm like, that should be removed. That should be stricken from their state constitution because it's really inappropriate. And I don't want everyone, anyone to ever think like one day we can revive this law again. Mm -hmm. There was another law in Oregon, that, they call them sundown laws, um, up until 2006 in the state constitution, uh, a sundown law was if you were black and you were caught outside after the sun went down, they were allowed to whip you uh, publicly and uh, multiple days straight. And while that had not been enforced in some time, it was still in the state yeah. constitution. The laws matter. The, yeah. And so we we're like that. That's another prime example. Like we, this is not compatible with what we see as just today. So we need to remove those laws and, 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 you know, Put them in history. Move, move on. All right. I think we have time for one more question. If we want to, all right, in the back there. Yeah. So first of all, thank you for what you do. <laughs> this is <laughs> no doubt. Yeah. Okay. Shout out to the teachers. <laughs> yeah. It's a very, very challenging time right now, particularly with challenges with uh, like what can be taught. I, I think more than anything else, like when I was growing up, I felt really disconnected with U.S. history because I couldn't see myself in it. There are a lot of stories uh, about a lot of people, and I didn't realize that my community played a huge part in the formation of this country. Uh, I didn't find that out till like way after, you know, like a decade after I graduated high school. So I think it's really, really important to frame things up into like how it's relevant to kids today so that they could see themselves in it but also see how they can be a part of changing it, especially when the history isn't so good, like how we can be a proactive part of like changing it. I never thought in my whole life that I would like change like federal laws, that I'd be a part of the Supreme Court. But I, like, I was just like a, a, a punk rocker who dropped, <laughs> dropped out of college for a minute, you know, like, but I'm on this path now. And I, I realized that it all it takes is a a lot of persistence and saying like, you know, I see this injustice, I'm gonna do something about it. And, and I'm gonna find other people who believe in that too and choosing to stand with them. So I think teachers in a very unique opportunity to like instill a lot of hope uh, and, and to have this like realize that students today have that agency of change that they have the potential to reshape the world in a way that is more just. That's a really great message. Thank you for sharing. And thank you for joining. Thank you. So, 
Constitution Day is not over. In fact, I'm pretty sure in just a few minutes, we are doing birthday cake on the Overlook. So if you want to grab a slice of birthday cake, um, but thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of your Constitution Day. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> There we go. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Oh, my goodness.